Hey guys, it's Tom Box here. Welcome to MSD.TV. And I got a question for you guys to ask yourself today before I get into the segment. Well, the question is, have you guys ever gone into a large scale event, expected to do, maybe to get the invite, maybe to hit the top eight, but just fall short every time, or just maybe get completely blown out of the water. But it's clearly not your fault, right guys? It's always the fault of, man, my deck just happened to brick that round. Oh man, if I just got my best opening hand, you would have definitely gotten screwed. Or maybe your opponent just happened to be a sack and top deck the right card at the right time every time. Or maybe you're just not as good as you think you are. But that is also a thing too, because I previously thought I was like, oh my god, I was the shiz, but I was not because, you know, people are just having a huge ego, it doesn't really help. But there are ways to actually mitigate that to earn your rightful place at the very top, get your invite, get your top, I don't know, get all the way to the end. And well, today I'm gonna share with you guys five awesome competitive tips that you can use to practice at large scale competitive events. If you guys want to help support this channel, you guys can check out the Patreon link down below. Any number of pledge will help me out because this helps make this channel possible. And I appreciate all of you guys out there. Of course, you guys get early access to proxies and sneak peek to all the new stuff that I am working on. Yeah, so check that stuff out. And of course, you guys get Discord. And if I ever stream again, priority to you guys and tournament entry, of course, to my large scale tournaments are free for you guys. Check it out. Now, let's go into this topic. If you expect to do well at these events, you have to throw in endless hours of practice. Hoban did it, Oscar did it, and Oscar threw in so much time to practice for his top 64 at WCQ two years ago, and then last year's WCQ, uh, his top 32. Lots and lots of hours of practice with his teammates, with me, with everyone that he can get a chance to. In other words, he just wants to lose and ex expose himself to everything before answering them all properly so that you can actually just pick it up on the fly because time is of the essence, even more so than ever. The first step is knowing which event you're going into, depending on the event you're going into, there's gonna be a different level of meta decks available. So at locals, you know your locals, I don't need to explain this, but at regionals, which is the one tier up, what do you need to know about this? Well, let's just say at regionals, you can expect about 60% of people playing meta and the other 40% may be playing a rogue or off meta. Why is the ratio so weird? Now for people that already earned their invites, it's pretty common for them to actually troll around <laughs> at regionals and they just play something they like for fun and they don't really care about the event, they just wanna have fun, which is still a thing. Or maybe you're just a huge fan of the deck, but then there's also the other 60% of people using the top tier decks, hoping to get their invites, hoping to get their top and get the representation out there. That, that still happens as well. So don't forget about that. But mainly because the entry level is so easy for a regional, there is no entry requirement. It's just the first competitive tournament you can actually get into. That's why the uh, competitive level is much lower because there's a lot more low tier players going in. Then we have YCS. YCS is extremely competitive right from the get-go because the pricing is just too good and you get a turnout of like thousand plus or maybe, maybe 800 plus. But because of that, the prizing, a lot more people are throwing in their best bet in there. They're gonna put the best decks in there. So you can expect the ratio to be about 80 to 85% of top tier decks to the 15% of not top tier decks. A lot of people are there just to have fun and they are the, the that number. But uh, for the other 85%, yeah, they are going to be pretty cutthroat. And probably after round two, you're not gonna see any more low tier decks anymore unless you're X and O. Unless you're, uh, well, you're not doing very well and you lost both rounds previously, okay? So and then we have the next tier above YCS, which is WCQ for NA anyways. I'm just gonna do this for the NA side. Um, WCQ, I guess Nats. What's so special about this? Well, it's very difficult to analyze this, but I'm expecting about 95 to 99% of people playing top tier decks because they're in it to win it. You've flown in, you drove in. There's lots of money already invested into going to this event, unless, it, of course, it was your hometown. But for all these people, they want to make it to the next level, which is Worlds. Worlds plays a completely different list, and then you get to go to Japan or something like that, and it's just a completely different experience. But that's what you're aiming to get to, and out of the 2,000 plus people, there's only going to be so few. And you want to make it up there, you want to represent, you want to be the one up the very top. I know you guys thought I was going to be like, you got to be the very best that no one ever was, but that being said, that means everyone's going to be playing a competitive level deck. So depend immediately you need to understand the meta. So that's the second step here, understanding what is in the meta. 
So if you know that the current meta basically has about four or five decks and what your job is, you have to do the homework and do the research of knowing what are the possible plays in each of these decks that makes them so devastating and don't let them get there. You might be playing one of these decks, so when you understand why these decks are so strong and what is in their side deck used to counter you, you need to do the homework on this. You need to check out all those deck profiles out there online, people talking about it. That is very important because that is research. You need the research in because you need to also know the trends that are happening of how people are answering various boards so you can know what you can and cannot do. Because if you don't do the research, you're going to get punished uh, by setting up incorrectly. Step three, practice breaking boards. How do you actually practice breaking boards? If you know the meta, you've done your research, you know that each deck has a power play that they're able to do. Of course, there's still nasty like OTKs or FTKs that they can still do if you can't stop it, whatever. But if you get into a point where your opponent can actually set up unhindered, basically what you can do is take out all the hand traps out of your deck, have a stack and that's your current deck and draw five cards out of it. See if you can actually break the board. Draw your sixth card and see if you can actually break the board. That's it. So Gokis would probably be like, oh, you're stuck in an extra link. How are you gonna break the, this board? If this was a game one, if this was a game two situation, can they actually still get there? That's a different story altogether, but you need that practice of seeing whether or not your deck is capable of breaking their board. And what are the key cards to help you break the board? So you should write everything down so that you have some data to actually review after you tried breaking the board. Why do you need to actually like care about this stuff? It's because if you know how to break the board, good. That means you can actually commit the time to break the board. But if you can't break the board, then what? Do you just like let your opponent build up the board and that's it? And then and then you try to break it and then you wasted like what, 10, 15 minutes? That's not good. And then say your opponent gets the last turn and then it's just over for you. You need to be able to see it so you can actually preemptively scoop if you know that if you are you need three cards to break the board, you only have one, you're gonna have one draw and they're gonna kill you next turn. You might as well just scoop because you only have one piece. But then if you have two pieces, then you can consider whether or not you want to top deck that last card just to see what it is and go in. So this is the kind of practice that a lot of competitive settings you need to be ready for. And that's knowing how to break boards, whether it be a Trickstar board, I guess in the current form, Trickstar, Goki, maybe the Spiral board, all the boards you should be able to figure out something that you can do uh, to break it. And you should practice this as much as possible. Just give that setup up, just put it up and then just go in and practice it before you even try to like get like human practice. So of course, the next step of course is human practice. Now, when you do the human practice, there's different methods that you can try out. What I tend to do before was we did a bunch of game ones and then we just roll the die, do the game one, roll the die, do the game one, roll the die, do the game one. Just keep rolling the die and do a game one and time yourself now because now you actually have to care about timing. So you do the game one and then you should actually make it so that your game one should be flawless. There shouldn't be no misplays because any misplay will turn the game around. If you won the die roll and then you also lost game one, unless it's like a solid brick, it's your own fault because you didn't fight hard enough for it or maybe you just overlook various things and that is not a game that you want to throw because it puts you at such a disadvantage, puts your mental state at such a bad spot. And then once you have done a bunch of game ones, you do a bunch of game two threes. Why does this matter? You need to practice siding. And for the first couple of practices, uh, you should be able to understand whether or not your opponent is going to make you go first or if they're going to choose to go first themselves. If they're going second deck, they're most likely going to make you go first anyway. You might as well decide to go first. But uh, for practice sake, just announce who's going to go what first before you actually side in your cards so that people can actually have a proper sided deck. Because it's actually more likely that you're going to get that case than the other one anyway, where your opponent sides in to go second and then makes you go first or like just the opposite is just not really expected. So you actually get a bunch of game twos and threes in and write down anything that caused a mistake like, and talk about it. You have to discuss with your practice partner about what was right, what was wrong. And hopefully you get a good variety of practice partners to handle different decks in the meta. Because if you're short various decks, you are just going to have to guess by luck of how they're gonna play. So that's usually not a good sign because you didn't get that exposure. And once you got that, all that exposure done, uh, try to play full matches against your teammates. Anyone that you can play, you don't even have to go to locals to play in the main tournament. Just get people, pull them aside, play a full match against them. And 
set a timer to 40 minutes. You have to set this timer now. It is super important because if you don't set the timer, you're just gonna lose in time. You're just gonna feel very salty. And like, let's be honest here. You have to live with it. So might as well set the timer and see how it goes. And don't forget when you're siding, that timer is also still going down. So based on that, practice with a timer. And number five, finally, this is actually a new step thanks to new time rule. And this is how I'm practicing for the new time rule. Do 10 minute games, seriously, 10 minute games. No one's allowed to think on their play for more than two seconds. If you're searching for a card, you search for that card right away. And that's it. If someone takes more than three seconds, you rush the other guy. You have to get into a habit of kind of telling people to hurry up because if they're taking too long, like they spend two minutes just searching for one card, that's not good. Two minutes searching for one card, that shouldn't even be a thing. Not a lot of people run 60 card decks. and. To go through it, the deck, it takes like, what, 10 seconds. If you take two minutes, yeah, they're burning the clock down and you need to get that out of the way. So what you need to do is practice these 10 minute games, set a time for 10 minutes. Once the 10 minutes are over, that's it. Count your life points because that is time. Why do you need to practice like this? The reason is that potentially your game one is going to take forever, take 30 minutes because you wanna grind out, you wanna get that first game win to get that advantage. True, it's a very good thing to have because it puts you in a good spot. Even if you lose, you have a safety net. Uh, here's the thing though, if you're 30 minutes in and you have 10 minutes to play one game, then you have to rush the 10 minutes. You wanna win within the five minutes, get two minutes, like three minutes to side or something, and then you got two minutes left to go in. You just want to run and gun it, and then you just wanna get the game in because that's more important than anything else. So during these games, what I'm expecting is if you have no hand trap, don't bluff that you have a hand trap, just let them go, just tell them F6, go ahead, just go in, do your play, and then I'll try to do my play and everything is just immediate and they try to catch misplays along the way because when you're rushing that's when misplays are going to happen and you need to be having a quick eye to spot these things if you don't spot it it will be devastating when a misplay is the reason why you lost so you need to be able to be quick so you can practice for this for the game one if you're practicing for game one of course you're practicing the proficiency with your own deck make it so that you're natural plays are instinctual you know what you want right away based on the hand that you have you maybe can analyze your hand for a little bit and then you just go ahead and just make your plays you can get a lot of games in this way and because you can expose yourself to more and more things it actually works out quite nicely but then mainly you want to practice for the games two and three sided uh just choose who's gonna go go first or second or maybe you have a deck that's sided to go second and then you have the other guy go uh first so that you can get a ton of games like that in to see what happens and then then reverse the role maybe you set yourself to go first and then they'll decide to go second and then you just have a bunch of 10 minute games like that these 10 minute games are going to really accelerate your proficiency with the deck and i think that is going to be more important than ever yeah especially with new time rule you need to be ready and uh maybe it will let you control your pacing even more and uh, if you can see your plays faster, that is gonna be a great thing. And that way you know, like if you see like a hand trap in your hand and you know that they have multiple targets, whether or not you should actually choose to hit their card with your hand trap. Like you can just instinctually just throw the card. And the faster you play, the more likely that your opponent is not gonna catch various things that you do. Uh, by that, I mean like maybe they have a call by the grade they just completely forgot to activate because they're like, oh, they do this, you actually do that. And then like, okay, keep going. And then maybe they just completely forgot that they had something. It is kind of weird and kind of cheesy. It's not exactly the best thing, but I feel like this is something that Konami kind of forced into us now. And that's a bit unfortunate. But those are my practice methods on the upcoming big tournaments. This is how I'm practicing for Nats right now. Uh, if I have any other suggestion, well, I'll probably tell you guys, but if you guys have any other suggestions on how you guys are practicing for uh, NAWCQ or any sort of big tournaments, leave it down in the comment section below. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. If you guys enjoyed this video and think that this is going to help you guys out practice, hit me up with a thumbs up. If you guys want to see more stuff from MSD.TV, hit that subscribe button. And uh, you also can check out my Patreon as well. Check out our Facebook as well. We have a Facebook and I tend to like, talk there as well there's also the discord and as always don't forget to hold on to your mst tv hey guys thanks for watching if you like this video please drop us a like so we know we are doing a good job and you can also subscribe to mst.tv for more fantastic videos by clicking on the button on the left don't forget to check out our partners at imperium duelist they make really high quality mats including some of my own limited edition release stuff and if you want to check out one of our past videos, click here on the right. As always, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV, and I'll see you next time.